Ladies and gentlemen, we're back today with somebody that's really exciting to have. He was a uh, founding member of the band Chumbawamba. Maybe you guys have heard of it. Um, he's also a filmmaker, poet, all-around creative kind of genius. Uh, Dunstan Bruce. How are you doing, Dunstan? <laughs> I'm fine, thanks. I'm very well. <laughs> now we've got over our technological problems. Uh, I can uh, relax into <laughs> this. And we're both talking. We're both at our wits end with technology. We're, we're slave to it at this point. So, yeah. So nice to have you. Honestly, um, you've been an incredible performer and artist, many mediums. Uh, it's hard to be an artist and you got to kind of balance things out. Uh, so what ratio do you think you are of ego to kind of self-deprecating and what works best for getting things done? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I've I've always um, I've always had a, a, a big ego. I don't deny that, but um, I think the ability to be self-deprecating is a is a skill that I have honed over the years. So I think with anything that I've ever done, um, I've, there's always been an element of being able to laugh at myself, uh, the ridiculousness of some things. Um, it, it, it's funny because uh, making the film, I get knocked down with uh, Sophie Robinson, who's a, a, a brilliant uh, a documentary director. She has never let me get um, ideas above my station about who I am or what I am. She didn't have a clue who Chumbawamba were um, when we <laughs> met. All she, she just knew the song, which was really refreshing to work with somebody like that. So we were coming from completely different uh uh, positions with the making of the film. Anyway, over the years, she's never let me get uh, ideas above my station to the point at which now on her phone, when my name comes up, it says Dunstan or Nadine. And Nadine is Nadine Coyle. I think it's Nadine Coyle, who was in uh, Girls Aloud. Uh -huh. who, uh, who is like, um, it was sort of famously a bit of a diva. So like if ever... If ever I get a bit too, uh, if ever I get a bit too, uh, stroppy or a bit too, like, a diva-ish, uh, Sophie always lets me know that, um, uh, I need to, uh, I need to rein it in a bit. But, um, I think with everything I've done, I think with Chumbo, I think Chumbo Wamba used to do it. We used to laugh at ourselves. I think with the film, uh, I'm laughing at myself in the film and in the one man show as well. I think self-deprecation is a, is a brilliant tool. Um, cause there's nothing worse than, uh, um, uh arrogance i think i think it's a, it's a very um unattractive um uh, characteristic mm -hmm. and um i think uh once once chubawamba discovered that humor was a really effective way of uh trying to talk to people rather than shouting in their face um i think that became a sort of like a a, a a tool that I've always used in whatever I've done, I suppose, is that humour has always been something that I thought was a really, really effective way to try and get a point across or or to find a middle ground with people where you can communicate. And so it's so you're not just uh, shouting at each other. I think that's really important, especially nowadays when we live in a world where, you know, a lot of the world is just people shouting at each other. Um, I think it's good to to find a way of communicating with people you might not necessarily agree with, and you want to find some common ground, and that seems to be an effective way of doing that. Yeah, I've I've been through that as somebody who sees problems in the world. If you have anarchist roots or something, you want to get your point across to people, but shoving your dogma down their throats tends to backfire. I I, I think that's very much the case. When we started out as a band, Chumbawamba, we were very much shouting at people and were very <laughs> indignant about the world and. You know, if only everybody did exactly what we said, then it would be fine. And yeah. then, you know, when you learn that that's not the way to try and change the world, that that's not going to make any difference whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you, and you have to learn, you know, tools and techniques to, you know, like, if you want to change the world or want to be part of some uh, collective movement, then you've got to find different ways of doing it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely agreed. Um, so you, and so this film is, is incredible and people should go check it out wherever they can get a hold of it um, because it's very, very creative too. It's not just your average documentary. It's actually quite creative and, and interesting and new. Um, but you also have been a filmmaker working uh, 
doing that for years and years, and you actually spent a little time in China. What did you? I went to, I went to China with uh, Sham sixty nine in uh, two thousand and nine, and that was the first documentary I'd ever made. It was uh, it's well, it's the first one where I was like uh, directing it basically, and um, it was an opportunity that I just thought was too good to miss. I think I think I've always had this idea that you should um, you know step out your comfort zone uh, whenever possible. I got the opportunity to go to China to make a film. And I just thought, I've got to try and do this. I've got to have a go and see if I can do it. And it was an amazing experience. Um, uh, China back then was like, it was, it was, um, it was a cultural shock to me because I just didn't know what to expect. And the interesting thing about going there was not Sham 69. They weren't that interesting, to be honest. Um, but it was the, uh, the people who were coming to the shows and it was that, those were the people who like really excited me and, I, and who I was intrigued by, totally intrigued by what they were doing there, how, uh, the country, uh, worked, um, how, how, you know, there was this like sort of burgeoning punk scene. How was that allowed to exist? Um, and it sort of changed a lot of my prejudices about what I thought China was going to be like. So it was an amazing experience, really. It was, it was, uh, it was great. And then I made a document. So I made a documentary about Sham sixty nine tour in China, where um, Sham sixty nine themselves were just four middle aged grumpy men who didn't really want to, who didn't really want to do very much. Um, and so um, you know, I, I sort of focused on the youth of China, who were far more uh, 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 interesting. I thought. Well, it seems like there are these. We have plenty of socialist kind of punks that you know, if we're if one's not free, we're all not free and stuff. So I can imagine, but yeah, the did they have the traditional kind of punk look to them? Yeah, that was that was the thing about it. It was a lot of like young kids who who were dressing in the fashion, but it was like working out what their idea of punk was, which was uh, which was quite interesting. And a, and a lot of it was to do with um, rebelling against uh, their um, family, basically, you know, the generations of family and tradition, really. So they were trying to find their own creative space, you know, within, you know, within their society. And I think that I thought that was really fascinating. That, um, they, they weren't necess- they weren't trying to overthrow the state. They were trying to. They were trying to find a, a creative space for themselves to be, express themselves and be the be who they wanted to be, mm. and not not have have to uh, follow tradition or a, a certain set of rules. And so it was um, to see them at the Sham sixty nine shows. It was like they was. It was obviously a really liberating experience for them to be in that space with other people who who felt the same as them. And um, and it was like uh, uh, the uh, you know the clothes you wore was it just it was like more of a signifier of what you uh, of what of of how you felt about uh, uh, Chinese uh, society was how I interpreted it, but they, but they were they they were they were they were really optimistic people young people they were really like you know they were looking they were just looking for things to be different and I think it was at a time when. China was opening up a bit as well. And so it was like quite an exciting time um, for them as well, for them to be able to see that there were opportunities to uh, express themselves in ways that maybe that the, uh, their parents had never been able to. So that was really exciting. Yeah. And the, the, you know, the very first oppressors that we ever know are our parents and we go through a rebellious phase and say, you know, got to change, do something different. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't, yeah. So it wasn't just that they were rebelling against, um, you know, they were re- rebelling against what everything that their parents stood for, you know, and that was a system that they, that they didn't want to be a part of or they didn't want to perpetuate that idea. Um, and, and so it was like, it was a, a, a rebelling against something that was systemic. You know, it wasn't just, it wasn't just their parents. It was what everything that their parents stood for. Um, and it felt as it did feel as though they were the first generation that were that were maybe doing where they were maybe doing that as a as a whole generation maybe. How what, you- what was, sorry, what one thing that was absolutely fascinating about China that I, that I, that surprised me was that there was this there was this huge middle class in in China that I didn't I didn't even know existed, but there was like you know there was like 
huge you know like there was a there was a a wealthy class of younger people as well you know like the 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 amount the technology you could get there in in 2009 was 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 way ahead what we could get at that time as well wow. we felt really old fashioned turning up with um you know little sony a1 cameras that you had to put a cartridge into to you you know to use and that it felt like really old fashioned the day were way ahead it felt like the only time the only time i've had that sort of cultural uh, shock before is going to japan in the 80s really it felt, <laughs> felt like that then yeah it, yeah it felt like that that like they were just years ahead you know <laughs> technologically and uh, in not necessarily in in uh, societally but definitely technologically they were they, they felt that they were years years and what, years ahead why why were you out in japan at that time uh, Chumbawamba went to play there in about 89 at some sort of uh, freedom festival or something. We got invited to play at this uh, at this festival. So we did about three or four shows there. It was incredible. It was totally incredible. I mean, obviously, we then went back, you know, when Tub Thumping was a hit in the 90s, and that was a completely different experience. This was 10 uh, years later. Yeah, yeah, 10 years later, yeah. But the earlier experience had, the, had been the one that had really, like, left a mark on it, on us because it was so weird. And it was before they had, um, you know, before any signs had translations on them as well, so it was just <laughs> Japanese scripts. So we didn't have a clue where we were or what we were doing. It was <laughs> So it was quite an adventure. It was a real adventure. Uh, but that was brilliant. You know, I loved that. When we went back in the in the 90s when Tub Thumping was a hit, Obviously, we had the record company there who were taking us everywhere. We had a translator. You know, we were doing, you know, we were going on this program, going on that program. We had, you know, so it was a completely different experience. And I think I enjoyed going in the 80s a lot more than I enjoyed going yeah, in the yeah. 90s. <laughs> yeah, that's good, man. That's good. I mean, there's some things. There's, I think it's one of the greatest parts about life is not knowing what the hell is going on. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, yeah sometimes that's a good it's not always a good thing but yeah. sometimes it is like i mean if you if you look at the state of the uh, uh the british government at the moment yeah. it's not such a good thing not knowing what the fuck is going on oh well, it's like we but, know we know what's going on fascism well, yeah, is I coming we do. yeah i suppose yeah. we do yeah yeah you're right yeah I, it's not like they're it's not like these people are, have abstract ideas they're they want fucking money you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you're right yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to talk to you about that because I don't really understand what's going on. I've been interviewing people trying to figure out why is everything going down the tube so quickly. Um, but um, I guess we'll, we'll – what do you think? Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know, but I read a really interesting feed on Twitter the other day about um, various um, – Oh, they, they, I mean, it was just this whole thing that was about saying how it was part of an economic master plan of people on the right, you know, and, um, and, but, but that, but that what had happened is that the markets had, had, um, had rejected it. Um, I think it was like an ideological movement, uh, right wing movement that was pushing all these, uh, pushing all these ideas through. And it felt as though, uh, trust was being used as a puppet, you know, for this, for these ideal ideologues on the right and that, um, it had backfired because the, uh, you know, the banks had, uh, had had not gone along with it, and uh, that's why uh, it was turned into such a huge shit show. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's all fueled by it's all fueled by. Um, I, th I think even before that collapse that happened, I'm sure there was a lot of people who made a lot of money, you know, because of that collapse. And that's you know, and that's a world, mm. you know, that we're not part of. But um, there's people making money out of you know crises like that, I guess. So what? Who are the lesser of the two evils between the f kind of crazy fascist politicians and these banks? That's <laughs> a good question. Yeah, <laughs> that's a really good question. Are you asking me to side with the banks now? <laughs> yeah, I'm. A, I'm going to make you pick one. <laughs> uh, the lesser of two evils, <laughs> or the evil? That, yeah, <laughs> the, the evil of two lessers. No, I, I wouldn't put you on the spot. Obviously, and it's just sides with bank shock. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. It's topsy turvy yeah. yeah, right I, now. Pardon? Everything's topsy turvy. Conservatives are anti-war. Yeah. Liberals are. Pro war in America, yeah. at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That's uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 I mean, there was a, there were, there was a sense. I mean, there is a sense of um, a disbelief that we're not going to, you know, we're not going to war to um, uh, to uh, in the in the in, to aid basically to aid uh, NATO to take over uh, the rest of Europe. Um, 
And so um, it's a weird, it's a, it's a weird world. It is a totally weird world that we live in. I know. I know. We're just trying to get by every day with a little, have a little gin and tonic and just try to relax. A lot, a lot of it. Do you know? I mean, I mean, I know. You, uh, I mean, you say that, 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 that. There's a grain of truth in that, in a way. Is that um, you know, like you realize that, uh, that after a while, that maybe, maybe our victories are just the small victories, you know. And uh, w- when are we going to ever have a big victory? We probably will never have a big victory. It's very unlikely that we'll ever have a huge victory. You know, maybe we'll just have small victories along the way. And and and, and in a way, it's it's a it raises interesting points about how. Do you engage in uh, party politics, particularly for us in the UK, where we have a very centrist Labour Party at the moment? And um, do we, uh, you know, do we bite the bullet and get involved, you know, on the left of a, of a very centrist Labour Party in the hope that um, we can influence the party in some way? Um uh, and, and I have friends, you know, I have friends, I have really good friends, uh, who are involved in that world, you know, who are involved in left wing organizations who have, uh, who have decided to, um, not necessarily be a part of the Labour Party, but to be a part of, uh, uh, the left that are, uh, trying to influence, uh, party politics. Um, uh, particularly after what happened over here with, you know, with Corbyn, when it, when it felt as though uh, the party was moving to the left, and there was a lot, there were there was a lot of optimism amongst young people, uh, and uh, and 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 pe- and people like me, you know, who thought this is amazing, you know, he is a party that, you know, because we've we've seen it in other countries in Europe where left wing parties have, uh, you know, have, uh, have, have taken uh, have taken power in that. And 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 I suppose it felt as though it was a, a it was a moment at which we thought something might change, and obviously um, the powers that be made sure that it didn't. <laughs> now we have a centrist, you know, we have a very very centrist uh, Labour Party, that, um, How you know, would- a leader who's telling people not to go on picket lines and stuff like that. Oh, but yeah. mm. you know, what's our you know at the moment it feels like what's our alternative, and do we sort of try and influence you know like that party from the, you know from the uh from the fringes so where was corbyn as far as was he in the center no he was to the left he was very much to the left uh and uh that's what scared uh, that's what that's what got a lot of people involved in the labor party uh because he was to he was like to the left yeah and it was what scared uh the uh the mainstream because uh they were worried that he might uh actually uh uh, take power, and when we uh, say, when we say mainstream, we mean the corporate interest backed politicians that run yes, okay. everything. Yeah, 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 exactly that. Yeah. Well, um, I I heard him talk, and I said, I like what I hear, but then he's like the Bernie Sanders, where they just kind of pretend like he doesn't exist when the presidential race yeah. is actually going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he yeah he he yeah. Yeah, I mean, he he was uh, he was um, he didn't he didn't really have the uh, well, I mean, he wasn't given the coverage, I suppose, as well. But he wasn't. Um, he became quite frustrating. Uh, I found him quite frustrating, to be honest. I, th- I thought there was times when he needed to step up, and 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 he and he didn't. And I, and of course, they were crushed. You know, they were crushed by all all the you know the anti the 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 uh, uh, anti semitism uh, uh, claims within oh, the, right. the, the party, and and that just you know that works for the right. You know, and that works for everybody to be able to um, uh, alienate uh, the Labour Party massively. Great um, strategy. Yeah, yeah, and it works. You know, it totally works. I was talking. Everybody got on board talking with somebody yesterday the human rights is a club that we like to beat over the heads of people that we don't like but we look the other way on stuff like israel and saudi arabia and say they're our friends it's fine yeah, whatever yeah, they do yeah, so. well, yeah. whatever they it's, can do to stay in yeah. power um so obviously you got this film i get knocked down incredible documentary film about you and your time in chumba wamba yeah very cool uh, can you explain a little bit of the spirit of the band, how it got started, and uh, the kind of the spirit of the film? Yeah, so that's um, yeah, yeah. So Chumbawamba started in the early '80s, and we were sort of initially very influenced by uh, anarcho-punk bands like Crass, uh, and um, 
we were we were sort of like uh they 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 were our model in the early days really of what we were trying to do but then we but then we uh we grew out of that pretty quickly um by about 84 when the minor strike happened i think we sort of we we decided that we wanted to be uh we wanted to use different ways of trying to get our message across um uh crass were always very confrontational in the way that they did things um i think we always tried to do things in a different way and we changed what we did over the years and we're always trying to find uh new and exciting and surprising ways to present um new ideas or new albums or whatever and so i think that is what we tried to do with the film as well actually i think there's a spirit of chumbawamba within the film that you know like chumbawamba never tried never never made the same album twice you know we always tried to change from album to album what we were doing and i think in the film i think we do i think um we we done although i never really consciously thought this it was only when Sophie pointed out to me that she said, "Oh, it's like it's like what it's like we're following the philosophy of Chumbawamba and never never doing the same scene twice." You know, we never like, and we always we try to avoid doing traditional, um, you know, music doc tropes of you know, Talking Head archive, Talking Head archive. We try to avoid all that and um, try to make the film, you know, I think what comes through in the film is the fact that we had a lot of fun making it and a lot of fun um, coming up with different ideas of how we would present uh, various things and just went with stuff in a way. When we interview Penny Rimbo and he decides that he wants to do a naked dance, you know, we just thought, yeah, let's go with this. Let's just do this. <laughs> and, and, you know, and it's just stuff like that that we never knew. We didn't know that was going to happen when we turned up. You know, we had no idea. And then he just said, oh, I want to do this. I want to recite this poem that I've written. And we're like, all right, okay, let's do that then. And then he goes, oh, and also I'm going to do it naked. And we were like, <laughs> okay, that's what you want to do. And it was just, you know, I just thought, I just thought it was a, you know, so it was a whole adventure for us. You know, it was like a, it was like a journey for us. And 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 what what happened with the film actually is, um, you know, because like the f the film's about like what you know, it's like sort of, it's sort of about what you do when you get to a certain age and you and you feel as though you still want to change the world, but you think that you're becoming invisible. And um and and what kind of happened was that the film became my way of um uh, you know re re sort of refinding myself and finding a way of uh, uh, of expressing myself again. And I used the film as a sort of a, it was almost like a meta tool in a way that it was like, here I am making a film about how do I get back up again? And here I am getting back up again because I'm making a film. Mm -hmm. And so the two became into, interlinked in a, in a way that I'd, uh, I'd never really expected that to be the case. I was just really passionate about making a film and making a, a mu I've watched so many music documentaries. You know, I wanted to make one that wasn't like any other music documentary. That was really important. To they me. they tend to have that formula, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do. Yeah, yeah. And some and, and that's great. Sometimes, you know, that's great. If that's you know, if you if, you know, some of those documentaries are really well made. You know, and it's a fascinating topic or something. But a lot of the time, you know, I just think, oh no, not another film about you know about not another film about a band who start off. Uh, and then they have, they get really big and then they break up and then someone has a, dies from a <laughs> overdose. And then, Oh, look, what a surprise. The band have got back together yeah. and they do a reunion concert at the end of the film. Woo. Yeah. You know, and that's just like, I mean, great, but you know, I've watched too many of them documentaries to think, um, I wanted to do something a bit different to that and be a bit more creative with the process because. One of the advantages of not having any funding is that you haven't got anybody looking over your shoulder telling you what to do. So me and Sophie <laughs> could do what, exactly what we wanted. And I, yeah, yeah, and that's come to, that's come back to shooters, you know, to shooters in the fall, biters in the bum in a way, because, because we've made a film that nobody actually asked for. So it's <laughs> therefore really hard to sell the film. So we finished the film, but it's really hard to sell now because nobody actually asked for it. You know, people are like, yeah, I like it. I really like it, but. I don't think we've got a place on our channel for it. Or I don't know what we'll do with our film. It's too weird. Or, you know, it's not, it's, you, you weren't the Beatles, though, were you? So why would we show this film? So it's all stuff like, so we're now coming up against all that sort of stuff. But we're really proud of the film. You know, we love the film in it. Uh, all the film festivals we've shown it at, we've had a fantastic response to it. So that's, uh, 
well, that's been really good. In to be fair, in your career having anti-capitalist and anti-consumerist messages in it, you were very, very lucky to get as high up as you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, I mean that that whole thing with tub thumping was just. I mean, obviously, it was completely crazy. You know, we didn't know that was going to happen to us. We never planned for it. But just when you get in that situation, you just got to do the best you can, you know, and you just got to do something with that situation. And that's what we decided with Chumbawamba. It was like, right, we've got this opportunity. What are we going to do? Let well, did you ever run into issues and butt heads with these these suits? Um. So yeah, well, yes and no, I suppose. Yes, yeah, of course we did. Yeah, yeah. Um, we. Um, We've been flailing around a little bit with an album we made before Tub Thumper, um, an album called Singing with Raymond that, that wasn't a particularly great album. And so we had to make a decision about whether we were going to uh, carry on as a band sort of thing. So we had, you know, a few crisis meetings and decided that, yes, we were going to, you know, let's all pull together and try and make an album that we all thought was really good. And so we made the, we made the, uh, the Tub Thumper album which uh, had tub thumping on it and um when we took it to when we took it to one little indian who was the record label we were on at the time they they hated it they didn't like it they said it was uh we needed to go away and either re-record it or they would get some big name producers in to sort it out uh we were furious at those suggestions and so we were like right Fuck you, we're going. <laughs> this isn't working. Um, so we're going. So we left, so we left the label with the album because we paid for we paid for the, the the recording of the album. So it was still it was ours. Um, but then we didn't have a label to put it out on. And so we had a couple of friends who were uh, who had previously managed some big bands in the 60s and 70s, um, who were old friends who were like, look, we'll help you, we'll try and help you get put this record out. And that's what they did. Um, and, uh, what happened was that, um, we didn't really, re we didn't really realize at the time that, uh, Tub Thumping was a song that was going to be, uh, you know, there was going to be a, that had hit potential in a way. It was news to us. We just thought it was, uh, you know, a good, we'd, we'd worked out that it was a good live song because it was getting a really good response when we were performing it live. Um, but then, but then the industry got interested in it. Because uh, they realized that that song had hit potential that we'd never so sort of realized. And so we had all these records. We said, so we had all these offers. We got all these, all these uh, offers for um, uh, record deals. And uh, uh, one of them was because uh, we were, because we'd always been huge in Germany. You know, we'd always been, we'd, we'd always been playing. We'd by that time, 96, 97, we were playing really big gigs in Germany. Um, uh, and so we, we had a, we had a, a, a really big following there. And so Germany EMI, uh, offered us, uh, were one of the, one of, one of the labels who offered us a, a, a contract. And it seemed really hypocritical that we should sign to EMI because in the eighties, we'd appeared on a fuck EMI compilation. <laughs> so it was, uh, uh, it was so hypocritical and cynical if we now signed to EMI. And that is exactly what we did. Well, and that was, and we had loads of, we had loads of discussions and arguments about it within the band, you know, before we signed. But, but weirdly, totally weirdly, their offer, it wasn't the biggest offer money wise, but it was the offer that afforded us most, uh, creative control of what we did. And so we thought that, um, we thought we'd tried everything else over the years. You know, we'd been on our own label. We'd been on small indies. We'd been on big indies. And I think we just thought, let's give it a go. What have we got to lose? We were at a point in our career as a band where we'd sort of reached a point where we had to try something new, do something different. And so we just thought, fuck this. Let's just do it. And obviously it pissed off a lot of Jumbo and the fans. That we signed to EMI. It, it didn't, what was weird though, it didn't seem to piss off people that we signed to Universal in America. Nobody, nobody criticized us for that at all. We just got criticized for signing to EMI in, uh, in, well, uh, we are, we are the boot lickingest country in the world. We, we just, we're okay with everything corporate and it's totally, we don't judge, <laughs> we don't judge anybody. <laughs> but, um, 
but 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 what that meant, I mean, what it what it means basically, as long as you're successful and making money, then everything's fine. Obviously, you know, like so, you know, you get told by all labels like that, oh yeah, we're in it for the big <laughs> haul because things are going well. As soon as things don't go well, as soon as you as soon as we didn't write another tub thumping, you know, that was it. You know, we were you know we were out on our asses and. That was it. And obviously in that small time that we we were, um, you know, we we were we were in the mainstream. I mean, we caused a bit of trouble whilst we were in there as well. Like going on American <laughs> chat shows, you know, and changing the words to the song to be about Mami or Abu Jamal or whatever. We did it about and then doing stuff at the Brits, you know, changing the words to slag off new labour and then chucking water on Prescott and all those sort of things, you know, we were like, we were trouble for, you know, record labels that we were on. So I don't think they were too upset to see the back of us, to be honest. Um, it was a short lived relationship that we had with both those labels. It was fascinating and interesting. Um, it wasn't my favorite time in Chumbawamba. Uh, it was just, it was just a, an interesting, uh, experiment as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I think there were times where we had a lot more fun being in Chumbawamba. But I think, I think we took, I think we took that success really seriously in a way that we, th in a way that we thought we've got to do, we've got to do something with the platform. You know, we, it would have been, I think it would have been, um, irresponsible of us if we hadn't sort of, uh, done the things that we did, you know, if we hadn't tried to shake things up a bit or say stuff or, or, or give other, you know, organizations the opportunity to use our, you know, our platform to say stuff or, you know, even if it was just little stuff like wearing t-shirt, particular t-shirts on stage or talking about, or talking about, you know, um, or talking about Mami or Abu Jamal or, yeah. or whatever it was, you know, that was, that was concerning us at the time and getting involved in the Dockers strike in the, you know, in the UK and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. That just felt really important to us that we should take those opportunities to, uh, to, uh, to say stuff about, um, various, uh, issues that were important to us. And, um, because like there, there was a journalist, right? Who said, who, who criticized us for, um, attacking John Prescott, um, and uh, and he and he said what well, he said he said something like if they failed to do anything significant about Margaret Thatcher who was in power for eighteen years prior to that, and yet they attack John Prescott. Now, the 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 problem with with that criticism is that we were doing stuff about Thatcher continuously, but because we were a small independent band who had existed in the underground. Nobody in the mainstream ever knew about all that sort of stuff that we were going on about. It was only once we got into the mainstream that suddenly we were listened to and our voices were heard. And that's when they get worried about what you're saying. Yeah, 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 exactly that. Yeah, yeah. And so then we become, and there, so then we, it becomes a bit uncomfortable because we're, we're, we're threatening their, you know, their world and, um, upsetting them by pointing out things that we disagree with about what they think is something that's wonderful. And when I say, no, it's not as wonderful as you think it is, you know, there's this, this and this about it. And so, uh, it, it, it did upset a lot of people that, um, uh, we were critical, uh, you know, of new labor at the time. Uh, how dare we speak out against them? And how dare we criticize, uh, uh, Prescott for not supporting some striking dockers, which is, which is what he, he refused to, he refused to support the, the, the dock workers. Um, and everybody was talking about how he was the, the only working class member of the Labour Party who was in Parliament. If he was the only working class member, he would have been the one who would have, should have been supporting the dockers and not turning his back on them. So we got caught up in all that sort of thing. And that's, uh, you know, and, and so it, you know, so, um, we were the thorn in the side. We were very much a thorn in the side of a, a lot of uh, the, and we were, we upset the record labels quite a lot. And, well, that, and the, that tickles me. I just love that. <laughs> well, well, the other thing is our teenage self would probably say you sold out, man, but there's nothing you can really do to these corporations other than you have a choice. You can take their money and, and have them give money to fuck anarchists, or they're going to find somebody else to make a, a music genre out of and try to sell sell records. And I think you guys might have been the last time they, they gave money to an anarchist musical group, probably. 
Probably, I would have thought so. Yeah, I would have thought so. I mean, I mean, the sort of thing that we did. I, I haven't really heard of anybody else doing stuff like what we did with the General Motors thing when we uh, we took money for a General Motors ad and then gave the money to Corp Watch and Indie Media. And Corp Watch were an organisation who, who monitored the bad working practices of companies like General Motors. And so we we thought that was funny, you know, to do that, to like, because they just wanted to use the song, you know. What do we care? You know, like if we can get the money off them and then use that money for something. Yeah, that, that's that's worthwhile. Yeah, uh, that, it, that at the time it seems like a a, a, a very subversive, um, you know, situationist thing to do, which really, uh, you know, which really interested us in a way that that um, you can use art in a way like that to uh, you know to support causes that you believe in, whilst also you know having fun subverting you know those those. Those capitalist tools, in a way. So, so I, I really enjoyed that thing that we did with General Motors. Um, it was, it was, uh, it was funny and it had a purpose as well. So it was like, I think it was a good piece of subversion, really. Yeah, yeah. And that's what the name of the game is. Uh, if you get that microphone in your hand, uh, subvert that crowd to be more compassionate, more empathetic, and you know. yeah, yeah, and that, yeah. Uh, and it's and 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 I think part of it is also, you know, like making, you know, like trying to get people on your side as well, you know, like making, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 letting people realize that we weren't, you know, like, a, a, you know, we weren't like, we, we, we were actually really lovely people, you know, as a band of people, we were like very accommodating and very friendly and very, you know, we just had strong political views. And it was like the point of fact is that you can be a lovely person and have strong political views at the same time. Yeah. And it's how, you, you know, it's how you sort of, uh, how you try and do something about it in a way, you know, like how you try and uh, um, how you try to change the world in whatever way you can. Um, you know, you know, when you see, when you see what part, well, you know, when you see what right wing organizations do to try and change the world, you know, it's just like, it's just full of hate and, mm. uh, it's, you know, it's, nah, there's got to be a better way. What do they call fear mongering? Yeah. 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 And it works. It works on a large cross section of the population. They does, they, yeah. They eat it, it does, up. Yeah. yeah, it's fear of the other as well, isn't it? It's fear of the unknown and all that sort of stuff. What they xenophobia. I don't yes. I, I don't know what it is, but I'm scared of it and I don't like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly that. Yeah. And I, I understand that well, but at the other side, I've only had good experiences from being more open minded and been able to make actually make changes in my life and, and use critical thinking. So I recommend yeah, yeah. it for everyone. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, it's hard to, it's hard, to, and, and I suppose the problem is, um, you know, critical thinking is very unfashionable now, <laughs> <laughs> which is a real shame, obviously. Yeah, yeah. That's, so, you know, we live in a world where everything has to be a simple, you know, lowest common denominator politics, uh, which this is just... Training. This is where we're at. This is get, this is my last two questions. One of them was: as things become gradually unhinged and people are going a bit mentally ill, how, <laughs> how do you relax and stay calm and try, you know, enjoy yourself? Try not to go crazy. What's your secret? Um, do you know um, <laughs> who says I'm relaxed? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, yeah, what do you mean? Um, it's funny. It's funny because like. It's it, it's it's weird because I I sort of um, um, I have issues about my self worth um, that are related to what I produce creatively. Uh, I find it difficult to sit down and not do anything. That's uh, because I always feel like I should be doing something. Uh, whatever that is, something creative. I feel as though I should be doing something creative. So doing the one man show, which we started to do on the back of the film, that felt, that feels like fun. That feels like my fun. Getting up on stage for an hour and performing that, performing that is, uh, is my idea of fun in a way and going away and, and, you know, going, feeling as though we're on tour again, going out, going out and doing the one man show is my idea. But it does take me two days to recover when I get home after <laughs> we've been away for a few gigs. Um, but 
I don't know. I'm not very good. I've never been the sort of person who's, who has a hobby, you know. Yeah, you just... I've, I've got a friend. I've got a friend up in Leeds who like has fads, and he goes from one thing to another. So like one minute he's flying drones around, you know, around his garden, and the next minute he's brewing beer. And I sort of envy him in a way because he always has something. There's always something else that he's solved. He's found a new. Every time I speak to him, he's found a new fad. You know, and it's it's. I sort of envy him in a way because he's always got something on the go. And I'm I'm like always thinking. I'm like now. I'm doing this one man show, and that's what I'm doing. But then we do it. Then we do a Q and A, uh, and people ask. So what are you going to do next? And I'm thinking, shit. I'm doing <laughs> this. This is what I'm doing. I haven't even thought what I'm going to do next. And now you've asked me that question and I've got to think about what I'm going to do next now. And I don't want to think about that now because I'm doing alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now I'm thinking about what I'm going to do next and I don't know what that is. So I'm in a complete state. It's like they're, it's a, they're insinuating, what, is this not good enough? What I'm doing now? Should I be doing something <laughs> yes. different? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like, is this not enough? I mean, I'm doing <laughs> Oh my God, you don't think I'm doing enough. I've got to do something else. You know, yeah. so, I'm, so I'm now planning on, you know, I'm now trying to get, uh, you know, make another album of, you know, of music. That's my next, next plan. Although next year we're going to take the, we're going to take the film on tour next year. So that's, uh, so that's what I'll be doing next. But I enjoy all that. You know, I really, I really uh, get stuff out of, uh, out of, uh, what, what, one thing I've really enjoyed about doing the show actually is going around the country and meeting, meeting people. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing because uh, particularly doing the show and then you do a Q and A, you realize there's like small communities of people who, you know, who are maybe isolated or, or, you know, feel as though, you know, what they're doing is, is not enough. And then you, you meet up with them and you talk, you know, we do a Q and A and we have a conversation about stuff and you realize that you're all, everybody's just in the same boat, really. You know, I might have been, you know, I might have been a successful pop star once, but that that counts for nothing now. You know, like now we're all just trying to do, we're all just uh, fighting the same sort of uh, struggles. You know, particularly when you get to a certain age as well. You know, it's like a, it's like an ongoing, uh, it's like an ongoing struggle to like not not give up in a way. And I don't want to give up. I never want to give up. No, no intent of ever giving up. Uh, I would hope that, that things like that would unify us more because we like to fight with each other and draw these lines. But the, really, the fact that we're all going to get old and that we're all fighting climate change, these are things that just are the biggest and most important things that everybody's in the same boat. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And what, what's really what's really good about the, the, the climate change thing as well is that there is a younger generation who are taking that really seriously. I find that really inspiring that there's young people who, who are out there who are doing stuff about it and saying stuff about it. Um, uh, it, because I think, you know, I think we're leaving them an, an absolute mess to have to deal with. But, but I mean, you know, I suppose I hope they'll be around for another 30 years. Yeah. It's not over yet. So no, no, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> do, do your yoga, you know, try to. <laughs> That's exactly it. Today, <laughs> before, before talking to you, I did yoga and then uh, I had a massage. That's, you know, when you get to my age, you just need those sort of things to get through <laughs> god i need both of those things i think nice massage uh, i'm so i tell people i'm so old now i'm starting to take naps after lunch that's <laughs> that's that's how you know yeah yeah you know so your, your show am i invisible yet yeah it's is it still going on it's a one-man show uh it's a big deal is it still going and What's yeah, yeah, I've got there? a few shows. Yeah, I've got a few shows left in the UK up until the end of the year. Uh, we're taking it to Poland next year because we had a we had this we had this amazing. Ex I mean, Sophie had this incredible experience in Poland uh, earlier this year in March. We went to this we went to a film festival called Millennium Docs Against Gravity that's in Warsaw, and we showed the film three three nights running, and the response was just incredible. And Chumbawamba went to, played in Poland in the 90s, in the early 90s. And it was at a time when nobody else was going there. There was very few bands going there. And, you know, their currencies, lotties, you couldn't check, you couldn't exchange them anywhere in the world. No, you couldn't take them out of the country. So it was really unusual for a British band to go there. And we, and we went there and we did some gigs and they were, they were amazing. The gigs were absolutely incredible. Uh, and, uh, 
and when we went to Warsaw earlier this year to show the film, there were people there who were at those shows in the 90s. And, you know, like the film, part of the film and the show is about what can I do to change the world? You know, what can I do? Can I make a difference? And all that sort of stuff. And I had people coming up to me after the screening of the film saying, look, you changed my life. Chumbawamba coming to Poland in the 90s just changed my life. If you ever worry about, did you make a difference? You did. You changed my life. It was, I was amazing. And so it was really emotional experience being there because it was like people coming up and, um, I mean, it, not that they were, you know, that it was just emotional. It was really emotional. And so, um, we, we sort of formed this bond with, with, with these people in Warsaw in a way. And, at that time, uh, there was, uh, there was thousands of Ukrainians, uh, UK, Ukrainian refugees turning up in Warsaw. And we got, we sort of helped, we gave some money to a charity there and, uh, and publicized this charity. And we've been raising money for them ever since, uh, from the show, from doing the show, basically. So we've been, we, 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 we you know, we, we got all this merchandise done and we're giving all the profits to, into the charity. And it felt it felt like a really good thing for us to do that we were we'd found a purpose that the show didn't just exist in a vacuum. You know, it wasn't just for and of itself. It had a purpose as well, and was like, and we were making a connection with people in other in other towns and in other countries. And that felt that that feels really important. That it's not just uh, it's not just art for art's sake. Uh, it's it's got a, it's got the show itself. Is is you know is trying to inspire people, and at the same time we're trying to raise money for something as well. Yeah, yeah. So it feels really you know it feels like a really uh, a really worthwhile thing that we're doing. You feel like you're rediscovering uh, people as far as uh, the difference between mm. how they act on the internet and how they are in real life. I think, especially after everything that's happened in the last couple of years, uh, uh, going back out and meeting people and being in spaces with other people. It's just fun. It's a fantastic feeling. That sense of community you get from actually being with people, you can't get that over the internet. You can't get that in a Zoom meeting. You, you've got to be, you know, you've got to be with those people in a room. And, and that's, that's when it feels visceral in a way. In a way have, that, you need to smell them, you know? Them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 And touch them and yeah. touch them stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Hugging and stuff like that. I mean, part of the, Part of the show is about the fact that, you know, like, you know, like we don't, you know, we're all like, we've all spent the last couple of years being completely isolated and, and how, you know, and how touch is, is the one thing that I've missed more than anything in the last few years. Um, it's, you know, so, so it's, yeah. it's as much about stuff like that, you know, and about that feeling of community, that feeling of community you get. The Q and A after the show is almost as important as the show because that's when you connect, that's when you really connect with people. Uh, the show's great, you know, for, and, uh, you know, for inter entertaining and inspiring people and making people laugh. But that conversation we have afterwards is, is, a, is really can be a really powerful and meaningful experience. I think being in the room with people like that is, is a, is a wonderful thing. Yeah. So I think that's a really important part of what I'm doing at the moment. Yeah, it feels good. It feels good. It feels good talking to you, being able to talk to people on this. But I used to be a street musician, and 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 I noticed that people like to drop a dollar in your in your in your case, but in in reality, they want to tell you a story about who they are and stuff. And that became more important well, to me than the music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just connect. Yeah, it's that thing of connecting with connecting with people in 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 real life. Basically, is yeah. you, know, you can't you know you can't beat it really. It's it's a wonderful it's a wonderful thing. It is. Well, we ran up uh, fifty minutes. We did pretty good. We're going to have a nice interview at the end. Uh, Dunson Bruce is going to come back. Is there anything you want to say before we sign off? Um, no, I think I said enough. I mean, thanks. I mean, just thanks for doing it. I mean, I just love the opportunity to talk about you know stuff. Because I think it's a way of, you know, this, if you can, you know, like, I just think we've got to keep on communicating with each other all the time. And, I yeah. just think it's, uh, and not maybe typing angrily towards each other, but actually talking face to face, yeah. at least this is the best I can do. So, yeah, I, I had one show, it was weird, a one show we did in Norwich. We had a, we had like a, somebody there who was a, he was sort of like a, a, a climate change denier and he was a anti-vaxxer and stuff like that. And, and I might, you know, we managed to, um, we managed to talk. 
basically. You know, we managed to talk without falling out and without, you know, shouting at each other. Or, yeah. Uh, um, and, and, and that in itself felt like an achievement. Uh, he certainly didn't change my opinion. I, I don't think I changed, I don't think I necessarily uh, changed his, but I thought it was a, a, a victory in itself in the fact that we could, um, you know, we could, tr I could sort of say what I thought about what he was saying was, yeah. he, I mean, I mean, he went, there was just this guy who went off on a rant about stuff and then, and then, and then he was sort of starting to take over the Q and A and I had to stop him basically. <laughs> and, and it's just how you do that sort of thing, you know, like, you know, it's how, you know, it's how you, it's how you, ma how you manage those sort of situations in a way to not, because you, you know, you want, I want that guy to change his mind. I want that guy to think that. Sure. All right, yeah, but at the very least, you humanize him to where you, you want to push him into a volcano a little bit less than you did before. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cause I mean, cause also, you know, like the fact that, you know, like why did, you know, in, in Britain, you know, we're still like dealing with the, you know, the fallout from Brexit. Why did that happen? You know, was that, pro you know, like, was that just like a huge protest for lot of people? And is that because people are fed up with mainstream politics or what? You know, why did people vote for that? Uh, that, you know, and so, you know, like, so, and, it, and, and that was, that was such a divisive thing in the UK, you know, like, and, and we're still suffering from that. And we've got to find a way around that, you know, like to be able to, um, you know, without just saying to all those people who are now suffering because of that, I told you so, you know, like, you know, you've got to find a different way of doing that. You know, you can't just, you can't, even if, even though I might want to go around going, well, yeah, you voted for it, you know, what do you expect? But, you know, you can't do, you know, you can't, that's not, that's not the approach. Those, those are your friends and neighbors, man, and it really makes a difference what, uh, yeah, what they're yeah, going to do. Yeah, that's, yeah, exactly that, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And, and I think that's the thing about getting older as well. You know, I don't think I would have been like, in, I wouldn't have been that, that wouldn't have been me in my twenties. You know, <laughs> you know, living in a squat in Leeds, you know, like <laughs> talking about anarchism all the time. I wouldn't have been going, well, I think we should have a discussion about this. You know, <laughs> you know. anyway, yeah. you'd share, you'd like it's just, but, but, like, but I think as you get, I mean, for me, I think it's, I think part of an important thing is as you get older, it's not to lose that edge, you know, because your politics do change, you know, or, you do, or maybe your methods of approaching sort of certain political uh, uh, conundrums changes. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you, you, your, your politics need to be less radical um, or, or your solutions less radical. It's just, you know, the way of trying to get to that point. Um, as, as many well, change. yeah, when you're young, you don't understand how the system works. And by the time you're or people work, and then by the time you get older, you go, well, I ca can't do it like this. And you can't do it like that. So yeah, you change. But, I'm glad, but at the same time, I'm glad that, you know, I'm glad that people are chucking soup over the, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sunflower. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that those people are there doing that because I'm not doing it. Yep. You know, and I'm glad somebody is and I'll, you know, and I'll, I'll find an argument as to why I think that's a good idea. But um yeah but i don't think i'm gonna do it tomorrow so but yeah. support you know i suppose and and and, Chum, and in a way that's what chumbwamba always tried to do with you know like um our our platform is 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 support people who are doing stuff or give money to people who are doing stuff that we weren't necessarily doing ourselves but we wanted to be part of that same continuum of descent you know in a way and i still want to be part, i want i still want to be part of that and i want you know i want to see younger people doing stuff and me think yeah, you know, right on. Brilliant. Great. All right. All right. Anytime anybody questions authority, it doesn't even matter what this really the situation is. I'm, I'm just proud. I'm just glad to see, uh, you know, David and Goliath or whatever taking on. Yeah, yeah. These bastards, whoever it is, bullies. Yeah, right. bullies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's okay. ne next time you come on, we're going to have an axe to grind. We're going to talk nothing but politics and we're going to just be... A couple of grumpy old farts talk. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm trying. I'm trying to avoid being a curmudgeon because I used because I was, I was what? a few years ago. I was a self-described curmudgeon, and uh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to like. Um, I think I've come out the other side of that. I, well, you do what you can, but it, when you see uh, the, the state of the world, it's not you can't you can't blame yourself, right? I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Still, yeah. I still find my eyes going to the back of my head a lot. Of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so well, we'll we'll sign off I'll, dude i'll have you back here we'll sign off okay bye everybody bye dunstan goodbye <laughs>